And like Dustin was saying, it is the beginning of what we call Holy Week or Passion Week. And the reason why it's called Passion Week is because of the great passion with which Jesus willingly went to the cross to give up his life for you and for me. What passion and what focus. And so we just wanna celebrate that today and lean into the story of Palm Sunday. And I think it's gonna be a good day, amen? Um, a couple of years ago, we were able to go to Israel and uh, we talk about it a lot. The reason why we talk about it so much is because it was so impactful for us, like seeing these places where Jesus actually walked in and the, all of these different sites, it was absolutely life-changing, a little commercial for our trip. If you wanna go, Dustin and I, our staff are going in November and we would love to have you go with us. It's amazing. Uh, but one of the places we were able to visit was actually this road where the triumphal entry happened. And what a powerful, powerful day that was. This is the road and it looks so different from how I pictured it my whole life as a kid. You know, you picture it being kind of flat and they're waving the branches. And then this is so steep. Literally, I'm such a dork, but I laughed the whole time because it was like either you walk fast or you fall flat on your face. You ever done a, a steep hill like that? You're like, oh my God, you know, but what an amazing, amazing thing to be in the place where Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Incredible. What was on his mind? I believe that the, the passion that he had was because he was here to fulfill a mission, a very specific, specific mission. He was here to complete and accomplish something so profound, and that was to die for you and me. And so his focus was set. He was on mission. Just a couple of days before Palm Sunday, Jesus brings his disciples to the side and he's trying to warn them, this is what is going to happen. And they still don't quite understand because we as humans, we're not super smart sometimes, or we don't have the discernment that maybe we should. And he's trying to warn them, this next week is going to be heavy. This next week is going to be difficult. And so he's telling them what is about to happen in Matthew 28. Actually, no, Matthew 20. It says, listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with the whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. He's trying to get their hearts prepared. This is what is about to happen. Let's look at Luke 9.51. It says, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, I love that wording. And in another translation, it says this, his face was set toward Jerusalem. His face was set not just toward the city or the buildings or the landscape of what was ahead, but the people, humanity, his face was set. And although he knew all of the things, because you have to remember, Jesus was 100% God, and 100% man. So he had the man side of him who had the fear, maybe the anxiety. The Bible says that he says, if this cup could pass for me, Lord, let it pass. Like that's, that's the human side. I don't want to face what I'm about to face. But then the God side of him, he was omniscient. He was all knowing. He knew it was going to happen, but he was focused and he was set. Here's what I've come to do. I have come to earth to die for a broken world and I don't care about the pain. That does not matter near as much as the passion that is driving me to accomplish what I came here to do. And so he is so focused in his mission. What an example to you and I in a time right now where our mission as the church, we have so many distractions so many things getting us off of our mission. What is the mission of the church? And in case you don't know, the church is who? The church is you and the church is me. We are the church. What is our mission? It is simple. It is to carry out 
and continue the work of Jesus Christ on earth. That is our mission, to carry out and continue the work of Jesus. That is it. It is not to build a cool building. It is not to try to look cool or to try to be popular. Sorry, wrong answer. That is not our mission. The mission of the church is very basic. It's simple and it has to be clear. We are here to continue and carry out the mission of what Jesus Christ started 2,000 years ago. Our mission is actually laid out really beautifully in something we call the great commission. Commission, the great commission. We are in mission with him. We are on mission with him, the commission. What is the great commission? I've thought about this word commission and looked up the etymology, the root of this word, and it means to entrust to. Now that to me feels a little heavy that Jesus invites us to be a part of this mission. And he says, I'm going to entrust this mission to you. Me? God, you know me. I am not. <laughs> You're probably thinking that, God, you know me. I am not perfect and I don't have my act together. For you to entrust to me something so profound and something so amazing. But yet he looks at us and he says, I'm going to entrust to you the mission that I started 2,000 years ago, what an opportunity, what an honor for us. We are on mission with Jesus. But what I want to talk about today is how to stay on mission with Jesus. How do we stay on mission? He was focused. His face was set he was on mission. There was nothing that could distract him from the love he had for people and the mission he had. How do we do the same thing? I don't know about you, but I want to stay on mission. I don't want to be distracted. I want to get to the end of my life and I want it to matter. I want to get to heaven one day and I want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to be one of the ones who when it gets to the end and so many people, their hearts are cold and they don't know the Lord like they used to and they're getting distracted. I don't want to be a part of that church. No, I want to be a part of the church that stayed focused on the mission of Jesus. I want to be focused and I want to stay on mission. And here's how you stay on mission. The very first thing is this. You have got to listen to his specific direction. Oh, Jesus is always speaking and he is always giving specific direction, always. But we have to have ears to hear what he is saying to us so we can stay on mission. Now more than ever, there are so many voices. There are so many things going on in our world. There's a lot of false doctrine and a lot of things happening. And if we're not careful, we will listen to the wrong voice and we will forget to listen to the voice of Jesus who gives us clear and actually specific direction. Direction for our context right here, right now. For the culture we are living in, the city we are living in. That is the danger. We've talked about this, about the church being so globalized is that we see God doing one thing in another city and we try to copy that. Or we see him doing something else in another city. Oh, let's try to copy of that. What is God saying to us here and now in our city, in our context, how do we stay on mission with Jesus? Do we listen to everyone else and what every, everyone else is doing? No, we have got to listen to the voice of Jesus as he gives us specific direction. Specific direction. On this day, Jesus does just that. He pulls two of his disciples out of the crowd and he gives them specific direction. Listen to this in verse 1. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with his colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you, 
what you were doing. Just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. What you have to see here is that Jesus told the disciples where to go, what to do, and what to say. That sounds pretty specific to me. Where to go, what to do, and what to say. Now we live in a time when people do not like to be told what to do, where to go, or what to say. I want to follow you generally, Jesus. Let me be in the crowd and wave my palm branch. I'm good with the crowd. I'm okay. I'm cool with singing Hosanna, Hosanna. All that is fine. But if you try to draw me out of the crowd and you want to tell me something specific, where to go, what to do, and what to say, I'm out. I don't want you to touch something specific in my life. Leave me alone. But Jesus is telling you, if you want to stay on mission with me, you've got to be willing to take specific direction. The word of God, it doesn't just say, be holy. No, it lays it out. It tells you, this is how you live a Christ-honoring life. The Holy Spirit will actually touch specific parts of your life, parts that you you want to hide parts that you don't want anybody else to know about that God wants to touch that part of your life he says give it to me if you want to stay on mission I'm going to tell you what to do what to say and where to go are you okay with the specific direction from Jesus if the church wants to be a church of impact we have got to be okay with him touching the parts of our lives that we want to keep to ourselves. It is time for us to listen to the voice of God. The next thing that we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to keep our eyes on Jesus and off of the crowd. Eyes on Jesus, off of the crowd. Crowds are weird. Crowds will turn on you. Crowds are fickle. Do you love the word fickle? I remember the first time my mom said the word fickle, and I was like, that is the, I laughed and laughed as a little girl. Sorry, side note. I think it's a funny word. It is funny because people are weird. They're fickle. You can't count on a crowd. So if you have your eyes on the crowd, I'm telling you, they're going to change their minds. You know, public opinion, it changes quickly too. I mean, when I was a kid, they had all the billboards, the Got Milk campaign. Anybody else remember this? And you've got like little cutie Michael J. Fox with his milk mustache saying Got Milk. You got anybody as old as me? And I mean, that was all, that was the, the craze. You got to drink milk and pff, not 1%, 2%. You need whole milk because whole milk is where it's at. It's going to give you strong bones. And then all of a sudden, you know, it gets all lactose, lactose and, and fat and all, right? Because crowds change and public opinion changes all the time. How about this one? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. How many has ever heard that, right? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, especially in the South. If you're going to have a test, you are going to have all of the things. And I'm going to do this with a Southern accent. Why? Because I am. <laughs> you have your eggs, bacon, toast, sausage. You have grits. Anybody know what grits is? Yeah, that's what you have when you're going to have a test. Why? Because breakfast is the most important meal of the day until intermittent fasting comes along. Don't eat until afternoon. Don't eat until after one o'clock. Why? Because public opinion changes all the time. I heard the craziest story about a crowd the other day. It had to do with an NFL quarterback. He's legit awesome. I won't say his name, but he's amazing. And he's not, does not play for the Cowboys. <laughs> different one. But they were winning, 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 winning. I mean, he was basically God in their streets. This guy's amazing. We're going all the way to the Super Bowl. And then they get to the playoffs and they lose one game. Not only do they turn on him, this guy actually gets death threats. I'm not kidding. Death threats for losing a football game. He has a beautiful wife. 
little children and you're gonna say, I'm going to kill you because you lost a football game. Crowds are crazy and crowds cannot be counted on. Crowds change. I think the most dangerous thing is that crowds are mostly wrong. The majority is mostly wrong. That's scary. The majority is mostly wrong. Here's an example of that. Adolf Hitler was actually democratically voted in in 1932 into power in Germany to say, this is the man we want. We vote for him. And then he turns out to be an insane man who murders millions of people. Yeah, the crowd is mostly wrong. But here's something even more scary about the crowd is that sometimes the crowd gets it right. Sometimes the crowd gets it right. On this day, the crowd got it right. And when the crowd gets it right, the temptation grows to get our eyes off of Jesus and start looking. Okay, I'm gonna look at the crowd because they got it right. And then we start looking at the crowd more than we look to Jesus. I'll prove to you that the crowd got it right. Matthew 21, eight through 11, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. See, you can't be led by the majority and you can't be led by thy minority either. Why? Because they're people. People are wrong most of the time. We can't look to human beings. We have to look to Jesus. He is the leader of the mission. And if we look to other people, then we are going to be let down and disappointed a whole lot. And I wanna speak to this specifically because I know there are some in this room that may follow church culture and lately, the global church have seen some disappointments. And you may not know what I'm talking about, and that's fine. Don't even look into it. It's not worth it. But if you do know what I'm talking about, and you've seen that there have been maybe some TikTok, some um, documentaries, some articles that talk about some people really letting church leaders in the global church who have let us down. And I have found myself so disturbed and just grieving I have sat on my couch and cried like a baby, and not because I even know some of these people, but because I have felt really ashamed that the church of Jesus Christ have not carried his name well. Man, what a shame for us to, to not carry the name of Jesus well. But then a lot of people that I have said under their ministry, and, and it's not just church leaders, it's been politicians, there's been so many people who have failed us. And I know that, but church leaders specifically, you know, you, you look up to them and you think that they're going to always get it right, and then some of them haven't. And I just wanna talk to you about that a little bit, and maybe, maybe you don't even know what I'm talking about. That's, that's fine. But I wanna tell you a couple of things. First of all, God has always used flawed people. Always. That's just who he is, why? Because human beings are flawed. They're not always gonna get it right. I will fail you, Dustin will fail you. We're human beings, right? Human beings will fail you. God has always used flawed people. I was thinking about specifically, if I am saying that word a lot, I'm scared I'm gonna say it wrong, specifically. <laughs> um, I was thinking about David in the Bible and how he wrote these beautiful songs that we still sing today, prophetic music that we still sing today. There was a prophetic anointing on him to even um, prophesy about Jesus and the, the crucifixion and all that it entailed. What a powerful anointing that was on him, yet David had failures in his life. He committed adultery. David he committed murder. Now, I'm not saying that that gives pastors and leaders or Christians a right to mess up 
a right to not live with integrity because I believe it should be the cry of our heart to be like Christ, to say, I'm not gonna always get it right, but man, am I gonna try. Every single day, I want my life to line up with what the word of God says. So I'm not giving them an excuse, but I am saying, don't be discouraged because God has always used flaw people. The second thing is something I heard a pastor say the other day. He said, if we removed all the flawed people from scripture, then we would end up with a very thin Bible. Basically, it would be Jesus. And that's it. And shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it be Jesus when it comes to our mentality? Eyes on Jesus and not on people. And if the failure of a, a leader or a failure of a pastor has caused you to lose faith, can I encourage you to ask yourself the question, if I lost faith over a man or woman of God that disappointed me, who was my faith in in the first place? My faith has to be in Jesus Christ. It has to be. That's why when we sing songs like Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He'll never let me down, never ever. And so I can put my confidence in him. He will never ever fail us. Eyes on Jesus. Why? Because we have a work to do. We have something to accomplish and it's big and it's grand and there is a lost and dying world out there and guess what? Jesus is coming soon. Have you heard? Have you thought about that lately? That Jesus is coming soon. He is coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. That's not perfect by any means, but we are striving to be like him. That's who he's coming for. So let us be found faithfully seeking him, faithfully striving to be like him, eyes on Jesus and off of the crowd. Get your eyes on him. The next thing you have to do is you have to recognize that the mission is bigger than the moment. The mission of God is bigger than the moment that we're living in. Something to think about, that right now, our space in history, you know, it's a pretty big deal to, to preach sermons that say, you were placed here for such a time as this, and you were. But we put such a big emphasis on our time in history, that sometimes we forget that the story of God and his love for humanity started a long time ago. It started at the beginning of creation from the time he created humans. He was writing the story of how he loves human beings. He was writing this story long before Jesus even came to this earth. The story of God has been put into motion. And so your space in history, although important, you need to lift up your eyes off of this moment and realize it's bigger than what you think. It is a big mission. It is a grand mission. And you've got to play your part well. It's a big deal. You're a part of something way bigger than you could ever imagine. So what happens this day is that Jesus rides into town on a donkey. And the significance of that is that there was a prophecy over 500 years before that. Just a reminder of this story of God being bigger than the moment. The prophecy is found in Zechariah 9, 9. And it says this, remember 500 years before. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. What a beautiful reminder that the story of God is big. And he has been writing this for a long time. The church of Jesus Christ is the most beautiful and wonderful thing to be a part of. Why? Because 
because it is something that Jesus Christ died for and it's something he put into motion so long ago. And he has preserved his church for generation after generation. That means my grandpa, yeah, my grandpa was a pastor and before him and before him, I'm talking generation, thousands of generations, the church has been going, which should be an encouragement to us that although you may think the church has seen better days, it's okay. You haven't seen nothing yet. God is preserving his church and he's still working through his church and he wants to use you and me. And so the mission is bigger than the moment. Lift up your eyes. See the big picture. You're a part of something beautiful. It is a mission that has outlasted persecution. It's outlasted all kinds of of turbulence, whether all throughout history, the church has lasted because God set up the church. The mission is bigger than the moment. And the last thing to remember is that the mission has always been humanity. That's pretty simple, right? The mission has always been you and me people. The mission is one of the most famous verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. Can you let it soak in again today? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the mission. Have you ever questioned the heart of God? Have you ever wondered, what is God's heart for humanity? Sometimes it seems like God the Father is the mean one and then Jesus is the kind and gracious one and the Holy Spirit's the weird one. <laughs> Don't act like I'm wrong. You know you've thought that. But I was thinking about this and wondering like, God, what is your heart for human beings? And there's a verse in Colossians 1.15 that I have been meditating on for the past two or three weeks. And it says this, that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You wanna know the heart of God? Look at the heart of Jesus who rode into Jerusalem, knowing the pain he would endure, knowing the people who would betray him, knowing the weight of my sin and your sin would crush him on a cross. And yet he keeps riding with focus. He keeps coming into Jerusalem with focus and with passion, heart steadfast on the mission. You wanna know the heart of God? That's his heart for you. You think of your very worst day when you made the biggest mistake you could imagine and you wanted to run and hide. You were so ashamed of yourself because you thought, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I made this big of a mistake. And yet here comes Jesus on mission to rescue you. That is the heart of God. The heart of God is always running after you, always chasing after you. And if he is on mission for human beings, always, then I want it to be my mission. If the mission of God is to rescue a lost and dying world, Lord, let that be our mission too. Have we got so wrapped up in our lives and everything we're doing and making money and our businesses and our families and our children that we've forgotten the very mission that Jesus died for? It is for us to reach the lost. What are we doing? What is going on with the church? Lord, shake us up and wake us up. Lord, have us invite people again. What happened to that? It seems like 
like the past 10 years, this past decade, that has really worn off. Like people just don't do that anymore. When really we should amp up our mission right now because he's coming soon and the end is near. And we should have an urgency in our heart. And when we get these invite cards, we shouldn't throw them in the trash as we're headed out or put them in the bottom of our purse until there's like crumbs from our purse on them and they're all wadded up. I know, I'm guilty. But could we use this as something we say, Lord, please put in me a desire to reach people. And will you open up the door for me to talk to somebody, just one person, Can we commit to that this week? God, just one person. Will you help me put them in my path and let me invite one person? Can we stay on mission together with Jesus? I believe he's calling us to do that today. He wants us on mission. This next week could be a powerful week, a life-changing week for someone. And I pray that our hearts are stirred. We get our eyes off of the crowd. We get our eyes off of other people. And we look to Jesus and he's saying, stay on mission with me. I've got big plans for this church. I've got big plans for your life. You won't even believe when I tell you something specific, where to go, what to say, and what to do. You won't even believe the miracles that will come out of that if you will just get on mission with me. I wanna pray with you. Can we just go ahead and bow our heads this morning? The first thing I wanna do is give you an opportunity to receive Christ this morning. If you have never, ever accepted him, and today, as I am talking about the love of God, there's something stirring in your heart. You say, I wanna know that Jesus who came for me. Would you just go ahead and just slip up your hand this morning? Just slip up your hand. I wanna know Jesus. We'll wait on you. I wanna know him. I wanna follow him. Thank you, thank you. Let's pray together. And everyone, let's just pray together, the whole, the whole audience. Lord Jesus, God, I give you my life. I wanna live for you. I wanna serve you. I'm tired of doing things my own way. And God, I give you everything today. I pray you set me on the right path. Give me a firm foundation under my feet. And I will love and honor you with my life. I give you today, Lord, I surrender everything, my brokenness, my pain, my past. Lord, take it all and do a deep work within me. I pray you would empower me by your spirit to live the life that you're calling me to. In Jesus' name, amen. And then the next group I would like to pray for is just every single person in this room. I would love to pray that we would all just stay on mission. Can we just stand for a moment? I just feel like doing that. Can we stand? Did you guys get invite cards this morning as you came in? I think so, right? If you have them on hand, would you go ahead and just hold them? This is not a commercial. This is like, this is a commission for you to just be the church this week and say, Lord, put someone in my path Let me talk to someone and I pray that this next week could be impactful for somebody because I was willing to obey. So can we pray together and just hold on to those cards? Lord, thank you so much that you have called us and commissioned us as your church. And Lord, I pray for every single person in this room. I pray we will be able to step outside of ourselves, past our fear, anxiety, Lord, and realize we are throwing people a lifeline that could radically change their life and generations to come. Lord, I pray for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that as we walk into different places, restaurants, our gym, um, the mall, grocery store, wherever we go on a daily basis, God, you would put people on our heart, Lord. And I pray that we would be vessels used by you. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, give him praise this morning.